Next would be the the Corvette, I believe. That was a C4 Corvette? A C3 Corvette. C3. A 1970 model. Factory 350 small block, four-speed manual car. Relatively, re- really decent shape for the year. Had it been fully renovated before you got it? Or uh, was it just no, pretty good? No, I mean, some, some things were done over the years here and there, but not restored by any means. That car came to us from Legacy EV. The customer reached out to them inquiring about an electric conversion for the Corvette. They kind of pieced together a kit through their communication. And then Legacy EV reached out to me um, and asked if I would be capable of doing the conversion since the customer was semi-local to me. Did the customer have a specific goal in mind? We we yes. talked about a Jeep and an Auto Bianchi, but this is the first sports car. Yeah, and I was really looking to do a '60s, '70s kind of muscle sports car for my next conversion. So this worked out really well. He wanted something equivalent in power and over a 200 mile range. That, those were his big goals. A lot of while you're in there's added up, and we ended <laughs> up with. <laughs> uh ac electric power steering he did a little restoration work on the vehicle this and that but overall turned out very nice do you know what the uh this next life had in store for the corvette was it going to be a daily driver a show car autocross yeah i think it was just gonna be a little weekend warrior retired guy for anyone that can pull up a mental image of a corvette or who's looking at the screen right now Long nose, small cabin. Where did you start with putting batteries in this thing? It was awful. (laughs) (laughs) Not going to (laughs) lie. Learned a lot from this one. (laughs) I mean, with any conversion, you have to utilize the space that you have. You can't make more space. With the fuel tank out, we were able to put, uh, we use different batteries. We, We, this is our first time or my first time using core power modules instead of uh, test the modules. And this is something that the customer kind of spec'd out with Legacy EV, but I have, uh, I've, gained a, I've gained a liking for them. Those are prismatic cells, right? Um, they're NMC cells, pouch cells inside they're of pouches. a- pouches, okay. Inside of a metal enclosure. Um, so either 3P4S, 4P3S, um, I think there's a 6S variant and a 12S variant. Haven't used those, but that's what I know about them. What is kind of the, what's the rough size of a module? I think we can all, we've all seen Tesla modules. How, how does that compare in size? Uh, they are a lot. I like to call them more modular. That's the word I was looking for. Okay. They are, so we used 3S, 4P modules. They are half the voltage of a Tesla module, but size-wise, they are a lot shorter, skinnier, but taller. (laughs) Okay. So in some ways, this did play in your favor to be trying to mount these in a really tight Corvette. Yes, I did mess around with the... uh, I just wanted to see where how many Tesla modules I could fit in the C3 and where, and... Um, with the space available, that using the Tesla modules would have been a lot more difficult. Fitting the modules in the car, the fuel tank sat above the frame rails in the rear. We were able to fit six, tes- or six core power modules up there. We fit 12 below that frame rail where the spare tire sat. And then the engine compartment uh, housed 18 core power modules. Wow. How many modules is that total? 36, I believe. <laughs> Total kilowatt hours of? 84 and a half-ish. I'd just say 85. Dang. Yeah, that that's like OEM car from, from a factory, yeah. basically. Yep. With that amount of weight, did you have to do anything with the suspension to be able to hold it? or uh, the, We didn't do any suspension modifications. It did lower the car slightly. Uh, still drove great. We did end up reinforcing the frame rail in the rear just to support the extra weight hanging off behind the rear axle. Are these, I guess, for all of your 
builds, but maybe this one specifically, are you guys hooking up water cooling to the batteries? Um, yes. Um, well, I'll start back with the Jeep. Um, I plumbed in cooling system for the Tesla modules. I cannot get them to raise in temperature whatsoever. Auto Bianchi, I did not cool and ended up being perfectly fine. Corvette uh, plumbed an entire cooling system in and never had battery temperature issues. My philosophy on battery cooling, if you aren't DC fast charging or racing the car, it's not needed in my experience. It adds uh, some complications and uh, adds a little bit to the cost for something that really, that not always needs to be done. One of the arguments in favor of, of the cooling, I, th I think, is battery longevity. But I mean, even watching battery temperatures while just going for a normal drive, I, even on the hottest day of the summer here in Wisconsin, it might be different in other climates as well. But here in Wisconsin, I cannot get the batteries to even increase five degrees. It's, they're just stable. I want to go to a racetrack in Wisconsin and, <laughs> uh, and race there because I got in California constantly getting the uh, heat soak on the batteries. Yeah. It's hot today here. 75 degrees, hottest day Ooh. of the year so far. <laughs> that is pretty toasty. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, with that Corvette, kind of going back to it, uh, sounds like you kind of, this is a soups to, soup to nuts build with all of the creature comforts, HVAC and uh, batteries, high range. Was there some compromises that did have to be made in order to, to make this happen? Nothing, nothing that comes to mind that is major. Um, we, we were able to figure out how to fit everything in that we needed to do, but there was not room for anything else. <laughs> That's the sweet spot, I guess. It, it, oh, <laughs> I don't like riding that line, but <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of hours involved in the front battery box uh, design and fabrication to fit those 18 core power modules in the front of the vehicle. We had to do what we had to do to fit them where we could fit them. And I, the battery box, it does look nice. But from a mechanic or engineering aspect of it, very complicated. There was an order of operations to assemble that battery box. Hmm. Interesting. That just a, by nature of not having a lot of room to work. Yes. Or having a 3D scanner at the time. Ah, a key component. Yes. <laughs> Before we get uh, beyond this, because I'm thinking, did you did you get the 3D scanner for the next car? Yep, we did. Okay, yes. so so we're still pre 3D scanner here. Yep. Um, what did, what motor did you guys end up using for the Corvette? Uh, the Cascadia Motion IM 225 mated to the Torque Trans 1.9 to 1 gear reduction box. That's sporty. It was, yeah. But I think that's 300 horsepower and 600 foot-pounds of torque with the gear reduction and ran a custom drive shaft to the factory rear end. That probably is plenty quick. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that, that car would throw you back in the seat. Have you thought of any other Corvette conversions? If you could convert any Corvette uh, out of the lineup, would you... would you redo a C3? Do you have an appetite for a C5 or a C6? Ooh, I never thought about anything that new. That would be fun. That would be def that would definitely be interesting. There's I would uh, consider doing I would consider doing another C3 Corvette if we maybe went with a Tesla drive unit in the rear and a little less kilowatt hours just for uh, space. The, the amount of time involved in the C3 project, from a customer standpoint, it's hard to justify spending an excess amount in labor hours just to get an extra maybe 20, 30, 40 miles worth of range. It, it almost doubled the cost of the conversion just to get the 85 kilowatt hours of batteries in the car. 
if someone was to call you today and and they were just thinking about a conversion, is yeah. there some best practices, things to keep in mind about that balance between uh, build complexity, time, and their overall goals? Are you do you kind of talk people through that now? Yeah, I mean that's. Um... I like giving a very broad range in the beginning because there's obviously there, a lot of people have the shock factor on what an EV conversion actually costs from uh, a shop. Um, you can DIY it for almost the cost of components, but there are a lot of labor hours involved into an EV conversion. And a lot of stuff you see on the internet is misleading uh, in regards to that. But yeah, I will, I will let them know the a, a, a very broad range uh, but it's heavily dependent on your power range and creature comfort goals and i walk I'll, i can walk someone if they are interested i'll walk someone through the whole process and we'll we can get a pretty accurate quote at the end of it i'm sure that that is uh, something that people appreciate because it is so new and a lot of people just don't know kind of what goes into it so after the corvette um you guys got a 3d scanner did you, yes. did you, were you just thinking about the challenges with the Corvette space wise and that's why you got the scanner or was it more of like a happy accident? Here's a tool that you're, you just were like, wow, this revolutionized my workflow. Both. Um, going over the complications we did have with the design aspect of the Corvette, um, I knew a 3D scanner would be very beneficial for me. Our engineering machining department at our sister company, they were also poking around the idea of getting a 3D scanner. Uh, so us together were able to go to uh, the owner of the umbrella here and uh, get him to purchase us a 3D scanner to sh uh, share, essentially. Oh, perfect. And so then that set you up pretty well for the MGB. It did. Worked out wonderfully. 